It is a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Ina Zaharevich from Cornell University, who will speak about characteristic polynomials and traces. Please, Ina, go ahead. Um, hi, thank you very much for um, inviting me. I'm going to do my best to keep an eye on the chat, but uh, historically speaking, I tend to miss it. So please, if somebody has a question in the chat, could somebody speak up and tell me? Um, so um, I will see to that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm talking about characteristic polynomials and traces and other invariants. And um, so just because otherwise I will forget, this is joint work with Jonathan Campbell, uh, uh, John Lind, Carrie Malkovich, and Kate Ponto. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about a lift of the Dennis trace to TR, topological restriction homology. And I'm going to assume that nobody knows what any of those things are. So I'm going to introduce all the pieces of it. And then uh, I will hopefully uh, be able to make a point that people will understand and think is interesting. Um, a quick disclaimer, there's a bunch of homotopical technicalities happening behind the scenes. And there's a bunch of places where, oh, you need to assume that things are point wise cofibrant or things are fibrant or reedy cofibrant or something. I'm going to be ignoring all of those issues. Uh, the paper is out, it's on the archive. So if you're interested in the technical details, uh, you should go look there. I'm going to be, every time we have to, some kind of cofibrancy, fibrancy derived issue, I'm going to be ignoring it utterly because I tend to find that the, nobody remembers those anyways. Uh, so I might as well not waste my time. Um, and uh, so, yeah. Um, and in fact, the other technical issue that comes up that I want to mention because it's, it's an important part of the paper is that there's going to be two different types of spectra technically that come up. There's both orthogonal and symmetric spectra that come up. I'm going to be ignoring all of those issues as well. And when I say spectrum, I'm going to pretend it's whichever one it is, which is most convenient at the time. And uh, that's all I'm going to be doing. And again, the technical, we, are, we wrote it very carefully in the paper because there were a bunch of these kind of technical issues. But for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to be playing fast and loose with exactly what category of spectra we're in, exactly how we're putting everything together. And I'm just going to ask you to believe me when I say it all works in the end. Um, so in this talk, uh, trace methods, I'm just going to say a little bit about trace methods. Trace methods have the following idea. You know, we want to compute K theory groups, something like this. So A is some kind of ring, or maybe a ring spectrum, or something else that has some kind of nice, interesting structure for modules over it. And these are groups which contain interesting invariants. And because they contain interesting invariants, we'd like to compute them. So the goal is compute these. And it turns out that this is really hard. Like to the point of, you know, we don't know what all the K groups of Z are at the moment. And the question of whether all the like K sub four, you know, uh, whether K sub four N of Z is zero for all n bigger than zero, this is the Van der Verde conjecture, uh, or closely connected to it. So there's these big conjectures. These groups are really hard to compute, even for fields. We don't know them. We also don't know, you know, the K theory of C. We don't know that one either. So pretty much, these are really, really hard. Um, and any kinds of good approximations that are easier to compute are extremely important. And one of the first of these is that there was a map from the K-theory groups to the Hochschild homology groups. And if you don't know what these are, I'm going to explain in a minute. So don't worry about it. Right now, I'm just, this is a quick historical note. And this is the Dennis trace. And then it's a, it was, there were some interesting results even just from this. This is a really low level 
basic algebraic construction, um, it's not a very, Hochschild homology turns out to not be a very good approximation to K-theory, but it's good enough, but you can compute it. It is easy to compute. And so it turns out you can actually discover some things just from even not this not very good approximation. You can extend it again. I'm going to explain all these things later. There's something called topological Hochschild homology. which is a better approximation and still fairly simple to compute. Although now, once you get to these things, simple starts becoming more and more complicated. Um, uh, and this is a better approximation. You can get better results. And then you can do something like topological cyclic homology. And it turns out that this is a really good approximation. Sometimes. And uh, there's a theorem by um, Dundas Good William McCarthy. I can write. Uh, Dundas Good William McCarthy says pretty much the derivative of K is equal to the derivative of TC. Morally speaking, uh, I'm going to put this in quotation marks to make it clear that this is not what they said. Um, that pretty much that if we can if we know how good an approximation is for one type of ring, it's a, an equally good approximation for another ring. And this is computable. It's not no longer easy to compute, but it's still in the computable range. And it's a fairly good approximation. Like there's some good results about at uh, primes p, how good of an approximation it is. And so this is actually the best techniques these days for computing k theory is k theory will map to tc. And then you compare it to other values of k theory and tc. And because of this whole derivatives are the same, we can say sort of how different they are. And these are sort of the best uh, current methods. And this is also by an abuse of terminology called the Dennis trace. In fact, everything that's uh, sort of where you start with this Dennis trace and topological Hochschild homology and then build up more things on it, it's called the Dennis trace. Um, and so uh, in this talk, I want to give another version of the Dennis trace. And this one is going to go through TR, which is topological restriction homology. Sorry, may I have a naive question? Mm -hmm. So what is the reason to believe that uh, K sub for N of Z uh, has to be zero? Uh, is there some evidence for this? So we know that K4 and K8 are, and uh, if this is zero, then um, there's a conjecture and number theory that I don't know in detail off the top of my head uh, that people think is true. And the evidence for it is the evidence of the number theory conjecture. Okay, and also K4 and K8, yes? Yeah, and K4 known. and K8 okay. are known. Although K8 was only computed, I think, two years ago. Uh -huh. So K, K that, that is a big new result, that K8 is zero. So um, it's quite exciting. OK, thank you. Um, so these are sort of the, the general, I suppose, animals in the zoo that we're going to be exploring today. Um, and I'm not going to be talking about TC at all. This is just sort of a general. You know, if you start looking at trace methods, you will see this TC thing a lot because there's a lot of really awesome uh, results about it. But we're going to be working with TR. So I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about TR and THH and what it is and why we might find it interesting. And I will say that this talk is going to have a slightly strange perspective on this because usually a talk like this starts with K-theory. And you know the speaker explains why K theory is interesting, and then you talk about approximations. But part of the point of this work is actually the THH and TR are themselves of independent interest. So I want to introduce them as these independently important objects. So I'm going to start with THH um, and talk about what it is. Actually, first, before I do that, I'm going to I'm going to draw the diagram. This is going to be the first time I draw this diagram explaining everything that I want, all the relationships I want to uh, mention in this talk. So the main diagrams. So 
So we have k of a, and it's going to map to this thing called k tilde of end of a. Unclear exactly what it is. And this is going to map to tr of a. And this is the Dennis trace. That's the main goal of what we're, tr what, uh, we're trying to construct in this uh, uh, paper. TR maps down to THH. And the K theory maps to THH. And this, as I mentioned before, this is the Dennis trace. Usually the original one was to Hochschild homology, but these days usually people just treat the map to topological Hochschild homology as the Dennis trace. So this is sort of, this is the classical map. Um, where if you, if you look up the Dennis trace on Ben Category Lab or somewhere else, this is the map that people will be calling the Dennis trace. And the result is that it factors, not I, just iota one, through there exists this map trace that factors through these two maps, which are very uh, iota one and g one are very natural. Um, and again, I'm going to explain all of this. And on the zero level, these are all spectra. If we take pi zero, we can get a result about groups. So this is k zero of a, and this is the one that most people are familiar with. This is say the free abelian group on uh, uh, projective finitely generated A modules, modulo, you know, for an exact sequence, we have B is A plus C. So this is the usual growth and D group that folks tend to be familiar with. Um, but I'm actually gonna be thinking about it as sitting inside K0 tilde of end of A. And again, I will explain what that is. Um, so the objects here, again, this is going to be this kind of growth and degroup, group, but the objects here are pairs of P, which is an A module, and F, which is an endomorphism of P. Um, and so we have this thing which is decorated with an endomorphism. So we can take its characteristic polynomial, and this will land in 1 plus T a of t, so power series in t with coefficients in a um, under multiplication. So this is the characteristic polynomial, meaning uh, this will map to the determinant of one minus tf. So, sorry, is f is a commutative? Uh, yes, sure. Let's assume a is commutative. Um, now, the, the trace, it turns out, the one that we lift here, this one is going to map to pi zero of tr of a, which turns out to be isomorphic to the big vit ring, which is actually isomorphic to this. So what this is really saying is that the trace on pi zero is really the characteristic polynomial. So the moral of this is that this map is a derived characteristic polynomial. Meaning it is a spectral lift of the map taking a characteristic polynomial. So that's sort of the goal of the talk today, to understand every bit of this diagram and to explain vaguely why it's true, or at least that it's true. Um, Mm -hmm. One little question. The, the inclusion of K0 of A into K0 tilde of, end of A, does it map B to what B and the identity or? Yes, it maps B to B and the identity. And the forgetful map is a section of that, which is why you know it's injective. Um, so yeah, um, that one I'm fairly is fairly easy. Um, I'm not going to worry about the THH bit of this. The, the main point of the K0 part is that the trace is really the characteristic polynomial once you apply pi zero. Okay, so this is, this is the main goal. So right now we're going to start with THH. What is THH? So the main objects that we think about when talking about THH are spectral categories. 
i.e. categories enriched over spectra. If you're not comfortable with spectra, feel free to substitute space and just every time I need it to be very nice, just think, oh, that must be because it's a spectrum. Um, so you have a, uh, you have objects and you have morphisms between them, but in fact, these morphisms come together to form a nice topological structure that you can do things like take smash products with and take homotopy co-limits of, and that's really what we're concerned about. Um, so how are we going to define? So first, let's let's start Hochschild. What is Hochschild homology of just an ordinary ring A? Well, it's the homology of the following complex. So at the bottom, we put A. And then we above it, we have A times A. And we have two face maps, because this is going to be a simplicial, uh, a simplicial abelian group. And the right-hand map is going to be A tensor B maps to AB. And the left map is going to be A tensor B maps to BA. Actually, it's usually the other way around. I'll do it the other way around. AB and BA. So the if you think, if you think about it as a chain complex, this differential maps A, uh, A tensor B to AB minus BA. So for a commutative ring, this is zero. For a non-commutative ring, this is something more interesting. And so then if we have A tensor A, te so then we're going to have A tensor A tensor A, and then A tensor A tensor A tensor A, and so on and so forth. And this is a simplicial thing. So you know we ought to have a de degeneracies in here as well. And I'm going to write out the face maps on the next level, and then you'll see how they all go. The face maps are D0 of A tensor B tensor C. This is A B tensor C. D1 of A tensor B tensor C is A tensor B C. And then D2 is the interesting one. It wraps C around to the front and multiplies there. So this is CA tensor B. So morally speaking, usually when we're constructing a simplicial object, we sort of have a, a string of things in a line and we multiply when we can. And when we can't, we drop one or the other end, depending on which end we're working at. In this case, the way that we're thinking of this is that we have a circle and we have a bunch of A's placed around the circle. And then we multiply adjacent A's. That's, that's how we're doing it. So it's sort of you shouldn't be thinking of these of these levels as having, say, three A's in a line. It's really three A's around a circle. Then it's four A's around a circle, five A's around a circle, and so on and so forth. And here, A doesn't need to be commutative, as I mentioned before. And this, um, and so you, we can just check HH0 of A is the commutator, is the abelianization A mod the commutator. Um, and for higher things, it's, it's more interesting. And the degeneracies just add in uh, identities, just the unit of the ring um, at the appropriate point. So, OK, that works. You can check this is a simplicial object. Or if you want a chain complex and you take its homology, and that's Hochschild homology. So if we want to make this more topological, we need to replace this with topological objects. But luckily, these days, we have a good category of spectra with a nice monoidal structure. So we can just replace everything with a spectrum. So if A is a ring spectrum, we define THH of A to be the geometric realization of, well, we have A at the bottom of this simplicial spectrum. We have A at the bottom, and then we have A smash A, and we have A smash A smash A. And again, we have our simplicial maps. 
and our face maps and our degeneracies, and they're defined in exactly the same way. So for example, D0 going from A smash A smash A to A smash A is mu smash one, where mu is the multiplication. And this is a perfectly reasonable object. So this is a spectrum. And so we can take its homotopy groups and that will be the THH group. So THH K of A is pi K of THH of A. So we've taken this algebraic construction, we've topologized it. I want to make a quick, very, but very important point. Naively, one might think, okay, if we have an ordinary discrete ring, we can take its eilenberg maclean spectrum and apply THH to it. That's an eilenberg maclean spectrum of a ring is a perfectly reasonable spe uh, ring spectrum. So let's apply THH to it. Surely that should give us the same as ordinary Hochschild homology. And one of the magical things about topological Hochschild homology is that it does not. THH of HA contains more information than HH of A thought of as a chain complex. And the reason for this is the smash products. Usually you wouldn't think, oh, you know, smash products, you know, you know, it's, it, the, it, the hidden information is in the operation, but it is because these are smashed over the sphere spectrum, which has many interesting homotopy groups and imposes higher relations and remembers higher information in a better way. Whereas these are, uh, sorry, these are tensoring over Z, which is really the same as smashing over HZ. So if you did this smashing over HZ, or if you were doing it K linearly smashing over HK, you would have the same information as Hochschild homology. But because we're working over the sphere spectrum, we actually have more information and we are better able to detect K theoretic invariants. So this is actually a really important subtle point that even if you just apply this to an eilenberg maclean spectrum, you have better, more information than just ordinary Hochschild homology. And again, we can draw this picture, or in fact, I'm not gonna even redraw it. I'm just gonna point to it up here. We have this picture again with the A's around the circle and they're holding hands and you know each simplicial level has a bigger circle. Now, if you're, category theoretic generalization of things minded, you might say, wait a second, with this object can be defined in much greater generality. We didn't actually need to know, we didn't need all of these A's to be the same. We didn't need to know that it's a ring spectrum. What we needed was some things around a circle that could combine into a single thing. And then a notion of a unit where you insert to go up a higher level, you need something that can be sort of neutrally inserted. Um, and that's really all the information that you need. So if you have, so let's do this for something way more general. Let's suppose that C is a spectral category. So meaning every, it's, it's a category, but all of the home sets are actually spectra. Um, we can define THH of C in the following way. So as a simplicial object, we're going to define THHC sub K, and this is going to be the wedge over all K tuples. I'm going to make sure that I don't mess it up. Uh, all K plus one tuples, so C0 through CK are objects of C. And we're going to take the HOM object from C0 to C1, smash the HOM object from C1 to C2, 
and so on and so forth. By the way, as a quick thing, we're going to be composing the backwards direction than as usual because uh, it turns out that trying to do it the standard way, you end up flipping too much and there's just too many mistakes that people make because things keep flipping. So we're going to do it the, slum, sli the more category theoretic notation way. Um, so uh, yeah, just as a warning. And then we're going to go all the way up to C k minus one c k, and then we're going to loop around to go from c k to c zero. So now what we have is a picture like this, where each of these segments, note segments, not points, there's a reason for this, is labeled with an object. And they're still going around in a circle. And we can still compose them. We have a composition. This is a category. We have a composition. So the face maps are compositions. And the degeneracies add the unit inside C of, you know, C I C I. Right in our endomorphisms, you have your identity, your unit map, and you can add that in sort of neutrally, breaking up a segment into two copies of the same one and connecting it with this. So the points, these are morphisms, and the segments are objects. This is the backwards to the way the categories are usually drawn, which is why I, this is the string calculus way of drawing things in category theory. And the reason it's going to come up is in a second, I'm going to draw a cylinder. And I don't know how to draw this picture at all properly unless we do this. So uh, keep in mind, though, that this is actually compatible with the way we drew it before up here. A ring, if you, th you can think of a ring as the Hom set in a monoidal, in a symmetric monoidal category with one object. Um, and the multiplication is the composition of maps. So a, a, a monoidal category, uh, an additive monoidal category of with one object is a commutative ring. As a, I suppose symmetric monoidal category is a commutative ring. And in this case, we were labeling with a, the points with our morphisms and the segments with nothing, which was our single basic point. So this is actually compatible with the original picture that I drew, even though it might seem a little bit strange. OK, so this is and May then, I interrupt again with yes, some basic please. questions. So, uh, so suppose we start with ordinary Hochschild. Then uh, together with the homology theory, there is a straight straightforward uh, construction of a dual theory, of a cohomology theory. And there is a natural pairing on the nose. Yes, just uh, mm -hmm. take dual complex and how this works for this topological stuff. Do you so, have also a natural par pairing? Uh, when, a, when A is nice, yes. Um, pretty much, so I haven't thought about this in a while. So please excuse me if I make some sort of, that I, if I'm misunderstanding or making some sort of stupid mistake. But uh, the circle has a splitting action which is what induces the pairing, where you take your circle and you pinch it, and now you have two circles. And you can do this with THH also, um, unless I'm misremembering something. I have not thought about the, that question in a very long time, so I apologize if I'm messing it up. And your no, notion of niceness means? Uh, <laughs> so there's nice, a notion of... So there's a notion of dualizability, which we're going to talk about in a minute, which is the actual formal notion of nice. But uh, for dualizability, you often need finiteness. So a vector space is dualizable if it's finite dimensional. So there's an analogous notion for spectra. Uh -huh. I see. Thank you. Uh, I also have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this um, TH for a spectral category looks like the spectrified uh, version of HH of a DG category. Mm -hmm. And, okay, so, uh, but in, in that case, in the, in the DG case, or in the, when you define HH of a category, this turns out to be HH of a, of a ring that you construct by adding up taking the direct sum of 
old uh, homes. Mm -hmm. uh, is there uh, an analogous thing here? That's a really awesome question. And I have no idea. Um, I am certain that if you, you know, I think Kate Ponto might know the answer to that, but I, I don't. I, um, but yeah, okay. Um, okay. Um, I think the short answer is, I think if you only have something like finitely many, essentially finitely many objects or something similar along those lines, then it should work. I'm not sure how it would work elsewhere. So, so that the ring is unit. Yeah. yeah, but I, but I, again, I don't, I'm not certain. Okay. So, okay, so this is now a simplicial object. And so then we just define THH to be the, of C to be the geometric realization of this. And there's this question that comes up sometimes, which is the question of why should this be the receptacle for a trace anyway? Why does it make sense that if I'm going to try to define the trace of something, it should live in here? You know, naively, at least for me for a very long time, I thought of a trace as, you know, a number, a trace of a matrix. It's not really something if you, you know, if you ask me, oh, how does it work in a circle? I would be like, why would you expect it to work in a circle? Um, what does it have to do with circles anyway? So I want to give you a different perspective on traces. This is due to Kate Ponto. Um, and I think it's really awesome. Um, and others also independently, but she was the person I learned it from. So um, I think this is a really great perspective on traces. Um, so what is so what is a trace? Okay, well, let's just think for a matrix. So suppose that F is a linear map because otherwise the trace is not defined. Um, how, how do we define the trace? So here is the most annoying technical definition of the trace of a matrix that I have ever seen. So we can take a map from our base field K. So these are vector spaces over K. So here's our base field K. We have a co-evaluation map going to V tensor V dual. Which takes some bait, which takes one to the sum of VI tensor VI dual for just any basis. Pick a basis. I don't care which one. Do this. It works. This is well defined. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to map by F tensor with the identity. So that goes to V tensor V store. And then this is isomorphic to V star tensor V because vector spaces are symmetric monoidal. And then we have an evaluation map, which sends V star tensor uh, W to V star of W, and this lives inside K. And if you check, this composite is the trace. This composite, this is the trace of F defined in whatever kind of uh, way you are most comfortable defining traces. But now suppose that we weren't in a symmetric monoidal category. Suppose we were just in a monoidal category. Suddenly we can't do this. By the way, it's not just necessarily a symmetric monoidal category. It could also be a spectral category. When you have, when you're, uh, so just as, a, as an aside, an object, so a morphism, F A to B is dualizable if there exists an object F star from B to A such that, um, and evaluation slash co-evaluation maps. And if you think about what this means for, say, 
categories and functors, what it ends up meaning is that your functor has an adjoint. So a dualizable functor is one with an adjoint, either a right adjoint or a left adjoint. And the question is, is it left dualizable or right dualizable? This is what matters. But when you have composition of functors, you can't just swap the order around. You know, that, that's going to be an endomorph, an endo functor on a different category. So that won't make sense. You can't just swap orders. The easiest thing to visualize is if this is some kind of asymmetric tensor product. But for me, the easiest is just thinking about functors. If V tensor V star is F composed with G and V star tensor uh, composed and V star tensor V is G composed with F, those are endo functors of different categories. You can't just say, oh, one is equal to the other. That doesn't even make any sense. Mm. In, I mean, just a very silly observation is that if V is finite dimensional, otherwise it doesn't have the least of case, then it's isomorphic to its double dual. And then it can be applied to the dual without switching the order. Right. But you need that notion, that fact that it's isomorphic to its dual, which is A, double not dual. natural. It's double, well, which is, right. It's isomorphic to its double dual. That's true. Yes, you can do that. But um, the fact that it's isomorphic to its double dual actually uses a lot of the same machinery. Um, and anyway, th this, this is a really important point. So I agree that for vector spaces, there's ways around this. But for this case in particular, it's a very important point. Um, Could I ask another question about that? So uh, mm -hmm. you, you said that the dual of F is a map F star from B to A. I mean, usually in, in the case of vector spaces, the dual is a map from B star to A star. And yeah. you need a, uh, an involution on objects also. Right. So, so what replaces is that? So what's replacing it actually is that we uh, is that we aren't replacing that. What's what at, what is actually happening that I'm trying to sweep under the rug because this is going because I'm spending more time on this than I planned is that what's actually happening is, is we're we're working in a bi category with objects and morphisms and uh, two cells. You can think of them as natural transformations is the most natural. And what's actually happening here is that uh, the the these V's are one cells, and uh, and the F and the co-valuation, the valuation, those are actually two cells. Um, and the, at that point, you don't like you don't change where you're going to and from because it's sort of natural. Um, uh, so I'm sort of slightly I'm sweeping that under the rug. That's a very good point, but in general, like this, this is this is what is going on. Um, the yeah, the most natural example of this is um, the bi category of um, categories, functors, and natural transformations. And the dual of a functor is its adjoint. And you can be right dualizable or you can be left dualizable. Um, okay, so you have. Um, Okay, so in general, we have this issue that we can't just swap the orders of things and have them be happy. That's that's bad. Um, so we need to do something. So the idea, uh, what comes to the rescue is we need a shadow. And a shadow simply takes everything to a situation where you can move things around. So a shadow is a functor to another category. where cyclic permutations of compositions don't are permutations of compositions are independent are um, invariant meaning so these so so these are shadows are usually written like this and what this means is that in, even if the symmetric monoidal product is not, is, even if the monoidal product is not symmetric, something like composition of functors, the, you know, A tensor B after applying the shadow is going to equal B tensor A. It's not strictly, I mean, it's only allowing cyclic permutations, 
by, you know, so A tensor B tensor C is going to equal C tensor A tensor B. So this is the machinery of shadows and I'm not going to go completely deeply into it. This is pretty much all I'm going to say about it. But the point is if you are in a context such as inside the category of categories where you don't have a symmetric monoidal product, but you can construct such a shadow, then you can now again do this. So you have your identity element for whatever your monoidal structure is, and you have the shadow of your co-evaluation um, going from whatever P to P star. And then we have our map F from P to P, and we can do, uh, F tensor one. And this goes again from P to P star. And now on shadows, this is equal to P star tensor P. And in fact, you don't need it to be strict equality. It can be up to natural isomorphism, up to unique natural isomorphism. And then we have our our evaluation map, oh, that was a B, not a P, a P tensor P. We have our evaluation map and this goes back down to the identity. And now this, again, this is a, a, a function and this is what is the trace of F. This is the trace of F under the shadow. And the theorem, Sorry, um, Ina, how do you know yeah. that this functor exists? You don't. Okay. If you have a shadow, then it works. You might not have a shadow. Actually, uh, there's some nice universality things. So generally you will, if you have any kind of nice spectral category, but just in general, I'm sure you can construct a spectral category that doesn't have a shadow. Okay. Actually, am I sure of that? Maybe I'm not sure of that. Maybe I'm not, I'm actually, I'm going to edit that. I'm not certain that you can do that, but uh, in general, for nice algebraic things, you will. Okay, and if it happens that the shadow exists, is it somehow unique? No. Okay, um, so you have different traces under yes, different Yes, you values. can have different traces under different shadows. And it will take values in whatever value the shadow category has like wherever the shadow category takes values, that's where the values of your trace are. Mm -hmm. But the point is this, we have a, uh, we have a, a by category of spec, we, sorry, we have, I, clearly I can't write today, I apologize. We have a by category of spectral categories. And the, there is a shadow which sends C to its THH. And this is, this is a shadow with values in spectra. So this definition of THH that we gave for spectral categories gives a shadow on any spectral category. So in particular, if you have a morphism inside a spectral category, the shadow of that will live inside THH. And so morally speaking, what that means is that the trace should be a map from whatever the kind of nice additive constructions you have on your spectral category, say your spectral category of modules over a, over a ring spectrum to THH of that ring spectrum. So this is morally like this theorem that THH gives a shadow is why traces live inside THH. So, so are you saying it's a kind of universal shadow? Yes. In fact, so Catherine Hess and uh, Nima, I always, I, I always misspell his name. I've, and now I can't find it in my notes where I wrote it down specifically because I think this is how I spell his name. I apologize if I misspelled it. So showed the THH 
of a by category is a universal shadow. The previous theorem just says that um, this, I think this is Ponto Schulman, although I couldn't find precisely um, who did it first. But THH of a bad category is a universal shadow, meaning all other shadows factor through it. This is a slightly different construction of THH than the one I'm talking about, but it's very closely related. And I just want to mention this, is, this just came out a little bit ago, and I was so excited when I saw it because I felt like there should be a result like that. And I was ridiculously happy when it actually came out. Um, so yeah, so THH is a universal shadow. This is the correct way to think about shadows. We are taking strings of things and we are wrapping them around circles formally and saying, now it doesn't matter. You can twist things as you need in order to be able to define a trace. And one of the things that you can get is that in fact, you can define traces for far more general maps, it turns out, than just this, once you have this perspective. But uh, this has taken longer than I expected, so I'm gonna skip that part. Okay, so this is why traces should live inside THH. So now the question is, what is the, uh, what is the source of our traces? So I had this K theory of C, how do we define you know, K of A, what is K theory? So K theory, there's lots of different ways of defining it, but I'm gonna use a cheat of the Waldhausen construction. Um, and this is actually not a cheat. This is actually a slight, uh, this is an extremely important technical point. And all I'm going to mention is there's an extremely deep, subtle, important technical point here that I'm completely going to ignore. Um, but the idea of K-theory is that, is exactly the idea of let's topologize this notion of splitting exact sequences. So we're going to construct a big com complicated simplicial objects involving all of the different ways that you can possibly construct exact sequences together to make larger things. And then we're going to break them all up using the simplicial relations. That's the idea. The formal thing that I'm going to define is this. We're going to define the following category, WK0, S, K1 through Kn of C. So again, C is a spectral category. It's in fact a spectral Voldhausen category, meaning it has both the structure of a spectral category and the structure of a Voldhausen category on the underlying category. And because I only have 10 minutes left, I'm going to skip what I mean by Voldhausen category. And I'm just going to say it is something where has a notion of exact sequences, which are the ones that we're going to be building up together. And this is going to be the full spectral subcategory on functors from K0 cross K1 squared cross Kn squared to C. Uh, on the objects that it should be a subcategory on. On the objects of W, K0, uh, S, K1 through Kn of the underlying category of C. So if C is just a Voldhausen category, there's a notion of which diagrams you want to take to make this work and uh, involving them being nicely built out of exact sequences. And the W direction should all be sort of equivalences. And so you have these big giant diagrams and you say only some of these are good. And we're saying take as the objects take those, but then as the morphisms, because, because we want a spectral enrichment, take the, sp the mapping spaces inside this functor category. And for those who know anything about Voldhausen categories, you're probably looking at this going, this is far too big. A whole bunch of those things are gonna have to be zero. Why are you taking the whole thing? And the answer is, it turns out those are really important for some null homotopies that we need. So we try taking the smaller thing and it doesn't work. This is the correct one, um, which was a surprise to us all. Um, but it works and it's good. And so now what we're going to do to find is we're going to define the K theory of C as the nth space. So K theory of C is a spectrum. So it's a sequence of spaces. So the nth space is going to be the geometric realization 
of the following simplicial set. I really want to emphasize that this is a simplicial set. We are always taking the objects of the category. Um, and this is all I'm going to say to it about it. There's a whole bunch of interesting stuff. I can give another three talks on lots of cool stuff about K-theory. And I'm not going to. I'm just going to say that this is how you define K-theory. You have these S dot categories. And these they have this one special direction of weak equivalences. And we are just taking the objects there. Now, why is that important? Because if we want to map from K-theory to THH, it's not at all obvious how you map from these functors into circles. I said the THH is made up of circles. Now we want to take these kinds of diagrams and map them to circles. And it's unclear how to do this. And the answer is pretty much that you don't. So here is how you map to THH. Suppose you have a spectral category C. The objects of C, well, we can map them to the wedge over the objects of C of a sphere spectrum. And now in Pisces, this is just literally two points, and in every circle. In every zero sphere, there's a distinguished point, and the wedge glues them all together. So this is pretty much just a pointed set in degrees. Of, we're just literally mapping this 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 discrete set to this discrete set. That, that's all I'm doing. I'm adding a disjoint base point. It just looks uh, vaguely fancy. And then when I'm going to do this, is that for every so if I have a point which is indexed by C, I'm going to map this to the identity on C, and now this is going to be in wedge over the endomorphisms, right? I can just include the identity into the endomorphisms. And this is the zero level. This is the zero level of THH of C, right? What is the zero level? You have one object and you take the, the wedge of all the endomorphisms. This is literally the inclusion of the zero level into THH. OK, so what this means is that for all k0 through kn, we have a map from the objects of wk0, s, k1 through kn of c. We have a map from that into thh of wk0, s, k1 through kn of c. And so now this is a multi-simplicial object. And we can take its geometric realization. So now we can take its geometric realizations of all of this. And now you get a map from k of c. That's what the left-hand side is. Well, k of c, the nth space of it. And this is going to map to something. So this is sort of a, a set mapping to a spectrum. And then this is going to be the suspension spectrum. So I'm just I'm vaguely waving away some of the details. But what ends up happening is once you put all of these together, this ends up being a map from K of C to THH of C. It turns out that adding in these WS dots inside THH and then assembling all of it, you get, you just get the same thing back. THH is additive, meaning that Putting in this WS dot inside it doesn't do anything except for wedge together a bunch of copies of THH. And if you do careful bookkeeping of this, what it turns out is that once you take what you need to get the left hand side, the right hand side just turns back into THH. Nothing else. There's nothing more interesting going on. And this is the Dennis trace. And it seems really weird that you can get something so interesting by just literally saying, hey, look, I can map an object to the identity map and then include that as the zero level into a simplicial thing, and that will give me something interesting. But it does. And the other important observation, which I don't think is original to us, but on the other hand, I haven't been able to find it anywhere. And whenever I tell it to people, they seem to think it's really interesting. So maybe it's us. I don't know. This formula says 
Why are we working with objects? We should be working with pairs of an object and an endomorphism of that object. Right? And now instead of choosing the identity, we could take the thing that's indexed by C and F and map it to F. That just very naturally extends. Why did we pick the identity? We didn't have to pick the identity. We could have had something more interesting in there. And that is what K theory of endomorphisms is. So for a category C, we define the category end of C has as its objects are pairs, C, F, where um, C is an object of C and F is an endomorphisms. And the morphisms are maps C to D, which are compatible with the endomorphisms. Meaning that the natural square that you might think to draw commutes. Um, and so this is a perfectly good category. And in fact, it inherits all of the structure of C. If C is exact, it's going to be exact. If C is additive, it's going to be additive. If it is a spectral category, this is going to be a spectral category. And so uh, in fact, this the trace is naturally a map from the k-theory of the endomorphisms of C to THH of C. Now, there are two maps from K of C to K from end of C for nice algebraic things. Um, in fact, let's let's do this for A so that we're not. So when I mean when I write A, so if A is a is a ring, what I mean is the category of projective finitely generated modules over A. Um, so there's two maps. One takes A to A with the identity, which is the the one that nicely is compatible with the original definition of the trace. Um, and so this is called iota one. And one which takes A to the zero map on A. And this one is in the kernel of the trace. That makes sense because the trace of zero is zero. And in fact, this works in far more general settings than just for discrete rings and modules. So in fact, this trace that we've been generalizing is a map from the cofiber of iota zero to THH. I'll do A, but you know. And this, this cofiber is what is called K tilde of endomorphisms. Okay, so I have a couple of minutes left and I think it should be enough time to say a little bit about TR, although not hugely a lot about TR, unfortunately. But I just wanna quickly, actually, are there any questions here? I'm gonna quickly zoom back to the beginning for a second. I just want to mention that your description of the Dennis trace reminded me of, I mean, the very first paper I saw on cyclic homology of categories due to Randy McCarthy about exact categories. Mm -hmm. uh, very similar description. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, this, this, is, this is not new. This is just a, uh, trying to explain why, how, to, how this map really works. Um, Oh, it was, well, yeah, this is building up on a, on a huge amount of literature. I wanna quickly zoom back here. So this is the diagram that I drew originally. So I've discussed this and this and this. So, you know, and then this trace and iota one. So really what's left is discuss T, to discuss TR. And I have 
one minute left and I'm going to give you a little bit of an idea of how it works and then hopefully that will be okay. Okay, so what is TR? So TR says the following fairly basic thing. It says, okay, so the way TC is constructed, is, so, okay, so THH has a circle action, very naturally, because it's made up of circles and the circles action rotates the circles and we're all happy. Um, and TC takes fixed points for the cyclic groups of order P to the N and takes their limit. TR says, wait, why are we picking a prime? Let's do it everywhere all at once. And so you take the cyclic, the fixed points with respect to all cyclic groups, and those fit together into a big complicated diagram, and you take the limit of that, which is analogous to taking the, uh, the finite completion of the integers. So it's sort of saying, oh, look, all the cyclic groups fit together nicely. You know, if you have, if D divides N, then, then CN maps nicely to CD. So fixed points via C, you know, CN fixed points should map to CD fixed points and so on and so forth. And they should assemble into a big complicated thing. And that is what TR is. TR, I'm gonna go back to talking about rings. Um, rather than spectral categories. Um, the ring stuff is not ours. This, extending it properly to center, spectral Waldhausen categories is, but in the negative one minute I have left, I don't have time to discuss the details of that. I just quickly want to say this is the limit of TH over all N of THH of A C N. Um, and so the question becomes, uh, if we want to lift the trace to this, the question becomes, how do you lift the map from K of A to THH of A C N for all N? So this is the lift that you want because we want to lift to the limit. We want a lift here. And the way that it actually ends up working, what happens is the endomorphism construction actually passes through the entirety of THH. So it commutes with a lot of the constructions that you're doing for THH. And what, sorry, I was gonna say the K theory of endomorphisms of A. We're trying to lift it there. And the idea is that given an endomorphism, F, we can iterate it N times. and put it into a circle with itself n times, and now lift it to sort of an n-fold THH construction. And these n-fold THH constructions are the ones that model these fixed points. And so what happens is the way that you map into this is you take an, you have an object in an endomorphism, and then you formally turn it into an object decorated with n endomorphisms by iterating that endomorphism n times. And then you map it to THH, where you have n endomorphisms instead of one endomorphism to begin with. And that is what models this, these fixed points. And so it very naturally ends up, because you can iterate endomorphisms, you've, you end up getting this whole chain of things going all the way up. And this ends up actually factoring through this limit. And I apologize that I didn't have a chance to talk about characteristic polynomials, but now I'm very over time, so I'm going to stop. Thank you very much, uh, Ina. Uh, let me let me react. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, are there any questions? Any further questions? Yeah, I just had one quick question. It's it's a bit going in a different direction, but I still ask. I mean, you see, it's about your definition of trace. So it's a part of kind of side point maybe but dimension is an aspect of trace of course i mean dimension is really trace of identity mm -hmm. so in in your general context uh, do you see uh, 
trace of identity not, not being an integer? I mean, do you get non-integral dimensions through this? It seems to me the point was you, you didn't have a symmetric monoidal category. You, you, you had a general, uh, maybe rigid monoidal category, but not, but not symmetric. Would that lead to non-integral dimensions in some sense in your context? And that is that is that so not the... if you're thinking about trace as a map, say from a sphere to a sphere. Yeah. Then it uh, can't. Then you know the the way that you're probably thinking about it is if it's a homotopy class of maps from a sphere to a sphere, right. that has to be an integer because pi zero of s is z. So for uh for spectrally valid valued traces you know that's the closest i can i can get to saying is it an integer and the answer is yes it is always an integer because it's an element in pi zero of mm -hmm. s mm -hmm. but i mean again i mean like in, in other contexts where you're dealing with with non-symmetric monoidal categories like representation categories of quantum groups you get these mm -hmm. non-integral dimensions uh, so I thought maybe in this context, these things somehow will pop up somehow, but yeah. It should, um, but you wouldn't have, what you would probably end up having is you wouldn't have your trace valued in spectra. You might have it valued in spectra over something else where you have, mm -hmm. because the trace ends up being a map yeah. right here from the, whatever the unit of your monoidal structure is, however you're thinking about it right. to itself. So what would happen in that context is you should have a unit that where the maps from it to itself have things other than the integers. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be in valued in spectra, maybe it would be valued in HK or something like that, maybe HQ, and then you could have rational numbers mm -hmm. or other objects that might have something interesting going on. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, very good. Uh, I have a big question. Um, what would be so? So I, you have a definition, I assume, of TRC, yeah, C being the category. So uh, what would be pi zero of TRC? Pi zero of P. Okay, maybe I misunderstood what you were saying. What do you mean by PI? PR. PR. Yeah, you know, the, 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 so you spoke about the THH, but then at the very beginning you said- Oh, that TR, there is a, yeah. TR, yes. It's yeah. topological restricted homology. Yes, yeah, topological yeah. restricted, yeah, sorry, I, I thought you said PR as in projective, uh -huh. and I was trying to figure out what you were saying. Yeah, so the, the example I wanted to, actually, I wrote it down originally. So yeah. if you are working over a ring, t, pi zero of TR is exactly the big vit ring. Yeah. Um, and in general, for many things, you end up with these generalizations of the big vit ring. Uh, what they would tell me this generalization of the big vit ring. Um, that category. So it it. it for, I mostly understand it. I have. To, I admit, I mostly understand it for. Um, for uh, rings, because that's the bit I've been was working with. But you can, for instance, you can also do this construction. If you look at our paper in section uh, 10, I actually had it up because I was looking up a uh, name. So give me a, so you can, um, instead what you can do with this is you can um, use this machinery to analyze periodic points inside, like you look at, take the free loop space and look at the periodic points of a function. So. If you just look at the function, you end up looking at its fixed points. And then if you look at a double iterative of the function, you're looking at the period, the two periodic points. And all of these assemble, TR ends up assembling into an object that classifies all finitely periodic points of your function. Mm -hmm. And this TR0, hang on, I'm just going to look this up in our paper because th this, was, this was not in my wheelhouse. This was one of my collaborators' wheelhouse. Um, this ends up being the the traces end up being the the uh, the fuller trace, and relate like these end up being related. This TR ends up being a ring of Reitermeister traces assembled in some nice way. But again, I'm not a fixed points person, so that this was my collaborator's work. So this part of the paper I understand less than I do the algebraic and, and homotopical parts. But you can also do these kinds of applications to fixed point theory, where um, you can construct these K theories and THHs and TRs of categories associated to say endomorphisms of a finite CW complex. Hmm. 
Okay, and um, the map G1 that I see at the bottom in your right, diagram. So, yeah, so this map G1, which I didn't really have, a, oh, I apologize. Um, this map G1 right here, this is the ghost coordinate. Okay. If okay. you know, if you're familiar with big with vit vectors, this was yeah. part of the talk that I ended up cutting out. Um, but this is the first ghost coordinate. Okay. The first ghost coordinate of TR is THH. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, does pi zero of TR have any? simple description for a a let's say discrete ring but not commutative i mean you don't have bit vectors in that case so what place is this thing yeah but i don't know that's a really nice question i don't know of uh, a good one other people there probably. are there are the latest definition of bit uh, for a non-commutative ring so in, like, in my the there. Thing. yeah well then there you go so no, it means that perhaps it leads to that. <laughs> I didn't mean, but I, I'm aware of the existence, later the so, existence of this thing. I will mention that a lot of the proofs in the part of TR is literally see, making sure that it works for THH and then correctly building it up homotopically so that it factors through the limit. So generally, a lot of the constructions I wanted, I was hoping to spend a little bit more time on why you could iterate maps n times and get this map into fixed points. But um, it, but I, uh, but what ends up happening is what, if you can define these kinds of truncations well, that's all you really need. You don't need to be able to define the whole thing. You just need to be able to define trun finite truncations well, and then you get these maps. So I don't know, but I have not thought about it for non-commutative rings. Uh, I, I have a couple of questions. Uh, where does the trace to TC fit into your picture? So the trace to TC is actually constructed in a very similar way. If you take the limit over N of THH of A with fixed endpoints in CP to the N, assuming that you take the fixed points correctly, um, you want whatever, you know, you have equivariant stuff and you want to build up the, the equivariant stuff correctly, this is TC. So the relationship between these is the same as the relation between the p-typical vit vectors and the general vit vectors. Yeah, yeah, but but the trace. Uh, I mean, you have a map. The the trace goes to TC, then to TR, and then to THH. Or? No, the the trace factors. Let me get another page. Hang on. You have the trace from the K theory to THH. And then you have two different ways of lifting it. You can lift it to TR or you can lift it to TC. But isn't there any map between TC and TR in the limit of one is a sub thing of the yeah, other? Yeah, so I'm gonna so. That's definitely true from the definitions. And this is something I have to say that I've always been confused about. I would have also thought that there should be a map from, and I'm gonna get this wrong, hang on, give me a second, that there should be a map like this. Mm -hmm. um, but I have never seen anybody use that for anything. And I've mm -hmm. always wondered, you know, or maybe it's the other way. I, I'm, I'm getting, you know, this is like sitting in front of a blackboard. It's going to go in one of these two directions because one is a subcategory of the other. Um, and uh, we have a map, map there. So you should, yeah, you should have a map like this. I was wrong the first time. Um, I would have thought that this would be the case, but I've never seen anybody say anything about it or mention anything about it or. Like, I, I've just not seen people talk about it before, which doesn't mean that it doesn't exist and that people haven't. It just means that in my limited knowledge, I don't know. Um, 
Yeah. I have to say, I t so the my main interaction with this was I've never been hugely interested in trace methods. I thought they were cool, but you know, I never wa really wanted to work on them until I started trying to learn about zeta functions. And this is sort of part of the point part part I didn't get to, but sort of zeta functions live here. And uh, so that was what made me want to learn about TR and the, my perspective about TR is really influenced by the fact that I'm studying it from the point of view of zeta functions. And sort of part of the point of this paper that we wrote was to try to convince people that sort of TR is the natural home for rational zeta functions and that that's how we should be thinking about it. Um, and that comes from this um, original diagram that I drew. So I didn't mention this because, you know, time research, but the characteristic polynomial, this map, it's actually an injection. And the image is the rational functions. Are you drawing? I, I cannot see with you. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. There are rational functions. So this okay. is the result of Almquist. -Vist. And so one of the ways of saying is, oh, look, you know, characteristic polynomials are rational, which is not surprising. But the other thing, the way to think about this is that this is really the place where zeta functions live, not these, uh, sorry, that, that uh, this is sort of what zeta functions are. And if you want to compute them, you want to compute them with something as close as possible to K-theory. Now, TC, you can't do because it doesn't have enough information because it only has the p-typical information. But this is sort of the place, the computational place where they can live. And I mean, they're isomorphic, so it's sort of, OK, well, you're just saying half a dozen of one, six of the other, but it's, it's not you know, for higher homotopy groups, TR is the place that's computational. Really, the, the data of the zeta function, everything it's based on, is up here in K0 of endomorphisms. But if you want to compute with it and work with them as really zeta functions are supposed to be as like computational invariants, they should be living in TR as the best sort of approximation to that. Um, well, can you can you explain a little bit more what you mean by uh, where the zeta function live in terms of characteristic polynomial frobenius or what what are you how do you see um, how do you interpret uh, uh, this um, zeta function leaves? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't read uh, yeah, carefully no, so, your paper. So it's. Um... So this is actually, so I mean, Jonathan Campbell has this, this paper called Facets of the Vit Vectors, where I think he explains it really, really well. Um, but this is sort of coming out of these. So if you have something equipped with an endomorphism, it, uh, so in, in the case of, say, a variety over a finite field, you have Frobenius. And there, that's the endomorphism you really care about. And if we want to do the zeta function, there's lots of ways of doing that. But actually, the way that relates as closest to the vit vectors that I like thinking about is if you take the k bar points of the variety. So this, this is, I'm going to write this here. So if we have, if, so if we have a finite field and we have a variety x over k, if you look at x of the k bar points of x, these have an action of Frobenius. So what this means is that it's an it's what's called an almost finite z hat set. So what I mean by almost finite is every orbit is finite, and there are only finitely more, many orbits of every size. And so the data of the zeta function is the data contained inside this sort of inside this z hat set. Um, 
And morally speaking, there's a bunch of morally speaking stuff that's happening here that's being swept under the rug. But morally speaking, this is the passage. So this mapping to this, this is the passage from K theory to TR. And this is, you know, so Jonathan has this paper, facets of the vit vectors, facet, the, I can write, facets of the VIT vectors, where he tries to explain this perspective. Um, and um, somehow this, this is how I tend to think about it. This lives inside varieties, which are hard to work with. And this, world, this lives inside almost finite sets, which is far easier to work with. And you need to worry a lot less about things being compatible. And this is really the set with this endomorphism is really the zeta function. And if you try to write this in terms of what is going on in rings, you end up with this thing that lands you in TR. That is a very fuzzy, hand wavy, quick, and dirty explanation. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I had a small question. At the beginning, you mentioned uh, as examples of how we do not know how to compute K-theory, the case of the integers, and also the case of the complex numbers. Now, in the case of the complex numbers, we actually know, uh, I mean, we know the torsion and we know the rest is uh, Q vector space, or uh, I think of uncountable dimension. But is there a description of that, I mean, is, uh, does do this, any of these methods give you some handle, some way of describing this, this uh, Q vector space or something? This, these methods I don't know of. I have a whole bunch of other stuff involving scissors congruence where I'm trying to get a handle on it. Um, and like the Goncharov's conjectures about precisely this connection between K theory of C and scissors congruence and describing precisely that. And uh, not this is sort of independent of that. This, I don't know if it can. Um, but uh, that's a good question. I should look it up. But over, off the top of my head, I don't know. I don't think so. Okay, thank you. So are there any further questions? I have one more. Uh, yeah. So what is, um, which one is harder to compute, this topological restricted or topological cyclic? <sighs> You are uh, very much asking the wrong person. I have never computed one or the other. I have done um, minor computations involving uh, VIT vectors over Z, but I have never actually tried you know, the hardcore actual computations of either TR or TC. So you need to ask somebody who's way more badass than I am. OK, but both of them are supposed to be harder to compute that, uh, than the topological Hochschild, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And still easier uh, uh, from K theory. And still easier than K theory. Okay. Thank you. So, are there any further questions? Otherwise, we thank Ina again.